We start with the 1964 Tall Ships Race, which started from Lisbon, went via the Canary Islands, thence to Bermuda. There was another cruising company to America, and New York was visited. It was on this race that a yacht called Tawau, not a very big one, but organised by the London Sailing Project, skippered by James Myatt, navigated by David Cobb, and they took part in this race with a crowd of youngsters. On their return, James Myatt and David Cobb gave many, that is probably well over 200, talks, film and slideshows about that venture. And it was as a result of their doing that that the fundraising was successfully started after several unsuccessful starts. They managed to get the message over in describing that particular venture, what sail training was about. Prior to that, everybody thought it was teaching people to become merchant navy officers or royal naval officers, and they could not grasp that we meant something different. Admiral Sir Charles Madden was flying his flag on that naval vessel and he subsequently became, became very much involved with the STA. In fact, he took over the chairmanship of the committee that ran the races. San Sebastian del Cano, I believe, one of the few four masters. This film was being taken from Lloyd's Yacht Club's Lutine she had taken part in the feeder race from Plymouth down to Lisbon and then had to make her way back. But before doing so, uh, they cruised around in the area of the start for one or two hours so as to be able to take these shots. The film for taking the shots was provided by the Honourable Greville Howard, who used to run various film uh, services or companies and he provided all the film for doing this and I managed to retain a copy of it. The original copy went off for making other films. Spectators appeared in everything. Yes, really everything. Lutine could either sail parallel to the square riggers and go about half a knot faster or she could go a little bit closer to the wind and then go at the same speed and this uh, capability meant that she could sail literally around every vessel taking part in order to film them from all angles. No doubt their masters were slightly apprehensive at times when Lutine had overtaken them and then sailed across their bow but great care was taken to get across the bow reasonably speedily and to try to see that nothing went wrong so that she suddenly stopped in their way. This, I believe, is the George Fock, the German naval sail training vessel. Yes, worrying, I think it might have been Captain Engels in those days. Um, without worrying her master as we went across her bow. I believe the telephoto lens was in use. It was not quite as frightening as it might appear to be. As you can see, the westerly swell is coming in from the Atlantic, thus hiding the vessels at times as they vanish down behind a wave. The STA's flag being flown from my uh, yacht Zulu. We now come to some historic film of the Sir Winston Churchill. It's not in chronological order, I'm afraid, because this is voyage number six. She was on her way from Rotterdam, where she'd been over the Whitsun weekend, and was sailing towards London, her first visit ever to London dare I say, notice that the sails are still clean. She is literally, virtually brand new. This was the first time that film had ever been taken of her, as far as we know, actually underway. And this is why 
uh, I went to a lot of trouble to ambush her as she came out of the Hook of Holland. We had to sail and motor to keep in front of her for about an hour and a half while they put up all the sails. They're still going up now. And we also had to wait an extra three hours because unbeknown to us, one of the trainees had toothache. He was taken to the dentist to have that tooth dealt with. This made the ship sailing three hours late. We, of course, didn't know that and were hove to waiting off the Hook of Holland for the Sir Winston Churchill to appear. Many of you may remember the black and white postcard that was taken of the Sir Winston Churchill. That was taken on this occasion as well. Many thousands of them were sold. It was taken by one of my crew who donated the photograph to the STA. As you can see, there's more sails up now, the topsails on our set. You may notice that the square topsail is not bent onto the yard. It was pulled up by the two top corners and the centre with earrings and the halyard, as it was called. And there she goes, off into the sunset. Doesn't look very nice weather ahead, but, well, let's face it, she's sailing towards England, and it's only Whitson. We now come to the sail trials, and you can really see how the square sails are set. And this was the first time, literally, that they were ever set. It hadn't even been done in port. We were sailing down the Humber at the time, and the theory was that we'd go by a sperm head light vessel with them up. I'm afraid that we were nearly out of sight past her by the time they were out. The mizzen being reefed for the first time ever. It was snowing, it's not specks on your screen, but real snow. And it was a long job because all the gear, all the reefing pennants and everything, all had to be made and designed as we went along. Sail trials are now finished and we're now on the delivery voyage from Hull down to Portsmouth. This was taken in the North Sea with an east northeasterly. Plenty of strength in the wind, very little warmth in the sun. You may think it looked warm and sunny, but it was in fact bitterly cold. The wind was pretty strong, about 4-6. You could see the reefs in the mizzen there. And she proved very, on, very early on that like with most sailing vessels, she could roll beautifully when running before the wind. You will see in these shots that there's no guard over the helmsman. It was not during the sail trials when John Illingworth called for a test jibe that we nearly hung the, helm the helmsman and he had to be rescued from the main sheet. The decision was then taken that we would have to have a guard built over the top of the helmsman's position. All of you will no doubt be familiar with that guard. One of the young crew, he found the cook's store of apples. A lot of people weren't eating too much at this time, I believe. It would be very interesting to know what had happened to these people that were on that voyage. The watch officer in the duffel coat is Leslie Williams, a very famous uh, yachtsman. There were several people who came on board during the voyage to get a little experience in advance, and he was one of them. Uh, the bearded gentleman was the first ever engineer. You could see the complete lack of guard over the top of the helmsman. Leslie going down below into the chart room. The usual view of the bowsprit, but no bowsprit net. This is because the one supplied with the ship was so weak that people tended to fall through it. It was dangerous, and so we cut it away. And later on during that voyage, when going past about Brighton and Eastbourne, the crew were busy making a new bowsprit net and fitting it whilst at sea. Only watch officers and watch leaders were allowed to do this job. I don't know whether they were considered to be more expendable than the others or just more careful. Now this view of the bridge, the usual one that everybody photographs from the crow's <laughs> nest, but of course you haven't got that guard in the way, so you can actually see the helmsman and the steering wheel rather more clearly than normal. The two koipu dinghies are visible on the stern, that's two sailing dinghies that we used to carry. 
Thus the Winston Churchill have the deck recorked the first winter in Camper Nicholson's yard at Northern Southampton. She's on the cradle of the slipway there. She can no longer visit that area. Uh, it's now Shamrock Quay. It's no longer Camper Nicholson's yard because that one was closed down. And of course the ship can no longer get there unless she takes her masts up because of the Wollstone High Level Bridge. She can't get under it. More historic film, we're now going backwards in time, the first ever tall ships race. This has taken off Torbay at the start of the 1956 Torbay to Lisbon race. A Swedish vessel, I believe. I think that's Mercator, that one. That, I believe, is Theodora. It used to be owned by Chris Ellis and was the start, in effect, of the Ocean Youth Club. The schooner in the background, no, it's not an STA one, they weren't even built then. It was Creole, owned by a Greek ship owner, and that Greek ship owner was persuaded by John Illingworth, the designer of the vessel, I believe, or the designer of the rig, to lend her for the tall ships race. She was being crewed by cadets from Pangbourne and Worcester, uh, and I think possibly some naval cadets. Notice the rig is quite different from our schooners. Creole was uh, a staysail schooner. You can see the staysails between the masts. If anybody really wants to try and identify all these vessels, John Hamilton may be able to help, but the real expert would be Dick Schofield, because he was the race director in those days. It would probably strain his memory a little, as it does mine, to go back that early. The vessel in the foreground is my vessel, the seven-ton Harrison Butler-designed, uh, very heavily built cruising yacht. The prettiest vessel in the fleet, I always think, the Danish school ship George Stark, a boatload of uh, spectators. By comparison with present day tall ships races, the ocean was very empty of spectators and uh, participants. Little did we realise what was going to happen in later years with the crowds and the numbers that we were going to get. There's Sagres, the Portuguese vessel based in Lisbon, racing towards her home port. And she was, in fact, sailing towards a big bank of fog. And I well remember her vanishing into that bank of fog and just disappearing. A very unusual sight. Uh, we just went, went into the bank of fog very shortly afterwards. And we saw nothing else until we were somewhere near St. Catherine's Point. 